Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar this evening. My name is Missy West, the co-director of Beyond the Game Academy and one of the moderators this evening. We're going to give a couple more minutes um, for everyone to get signed in and for this special conversation uh, about racism and ethnicity. We're hoping everyone is extremely excited about the panel we have joining us, all of which are exceptional leaders in their current careers and all whom have had a major positive impact on me personally as a teammate, a friend, a mentor throughout my entire life. To share a brief introduction as to who I am, again, my name is Missy West. I was a three-sport athlete in high school from upstate New York from a majority white community. I played basketball at Duke University alongside of a lot of these lovely ladies on the panel, played professionally in Germany, followed by a 12-year college coaching career. And it was during this time as a college coach that I recognized I had a higher calling, which led me to Beyond the Game Academy. For several of you, this is your first time hearing about us, so we want to personally welcome you here this evening. Beyond the Game Academy is exactly what it sounds like. Our work stems beyond the X's and O's in sport by helping individuals build confidence and resilience bring awareness to our history and social issues, as well as create environments of inclusion, equality, and opportunity. We work mainly with student athletes, parents, teams, and coaches, but have also recently ventured into the corporate space where we discuss all of the life skills sports has taught us and how it has advanced us into our professional careers. Again, we appreciate all of you for joining us this evening and taking this initial step in educating yourself and educating ourselves so we can begin to take the necessary steps we need for positive change. Sorry, I was muted. Hi, everybody. I'm Colin Healy, co-director of Beyond the Game Academy with Missy West. I want to recognize Missy who does everything straight from the heart uh, with goodness, uh, open heart and open mind. She certainly keeps me busy, uh, but she makes me better. Uh, and that is one of the greatest goals of Beyond the Game. I'm a former UConn women's basketball player. I had the honor of wearing the uniform of teammates that continue to influence the game. I'm forever grateful to Coach Ayama and Coach Daly for allowing me the opportunity to feel the accomplishment of walking onto the team after serving as a manager for a year contributing on the floor and eventually awarding me a full scholarship. My UConn journey changed the trajectory of my life and propelled me into a successful career in corporate America. And today as a consultant, motivational speaker and soon to be author. Adding to what Missy West had just said at the Beyond the Game Academy, we create in-classroom workshops to highlight life lessons that sport participation provides, how teamwork and resilience prepares athletes for the challenges of life both personally and professionally. Sport participation allowed us at a young age to recognize and embrace the benefits of diversity, the unique skills and talents of each individual for each position, leverage with chemistry built on respect for one another to achieve a common goal. The teams that do this best, not only in sport, but in corporate America, increase their odds of winning. We also recognize teachable moments like last summer when the US women's soccer team won the World Cup, they immediately began to use their platform as champions to champion the fight for equal pay and gender equality. We decided we knew historically and were educated and personally experienced and equipped to bring that topic to our academy last year. Young women researched and taught one another about Billie Jean King, Rosa Parks, RBG, Harry Beecher Stowe and Susan B. Anthony. And the athletes understood that the women's soccer team's fight for equality was part of a continuum in the fight for gender equality for all women for all time. Here we are today in a teachable moment. And Missy and I have a platform and an audience looking to us for guidance. As Missy stated, we did not feel we could do this appropriately as we only presented the white experience of America. 
we realize that we do not all experience America the same way. And we do not all experience life the same way. We are heavily influenced by where we grew up, who our parents were, what our parents believed, what our community believed, and it frames who we are. It's human nature to form our opinions and decisions based on our personal experiences. However, I know now that my personal experience and views on things limit me on making objective decisions and opinions. It's important to receive other people's perspectives and understand their experiences so we can understand one another. So here we are tonight to start an important conversation among friends. We do not have all the answers, but we have the right people with the right intentions willing to share their American experience. And tonight is just the beginning. We intend to continue this dialogue, different people with different perspectives and discuss what we can do, where we are now to recognize the pain some of our neighbors are feeling, why they're feeling it and ask ourselves, what can I do as an individual, a family, a team, and a community? People like us can make a difference. We cannot wait for the people in power to come up with a solution. Let's be clear, there is no one static solution. This will take time and truth, discomfort ideas, application learnings, remodeling and testing again. But Missy and I are committed to keeping this dialogue and we hope that you will not only stay connected with us, but reach out to us and see what we're able to do together. And with that, let me turn to this panel of powerful women. Can I just say this panel alone can probably change the world. <laughs> and I had a chance to speak with them earlier this week and it's my true honor that they're here with us tonight. So Elizabeth Williams, I'm gonna turn to you and ask you to introduce yourself and share a role model that we can all learn from. Hey everyone. My name is Elizabeth Williams. I am from Virginia Beach, Virginia. I graduated from Duke in 2015 with a BS in psychology. I am currently playing for the Atlanta Dream in the WNBA. I'm heading into my sixth season, um, which is hard to believe. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be a part of this panel with awesome, incredible women. And um, I'm just looking forward to kind of sharing my personal story, but also listening to everyone else. And I would say a good role model is someone actually I was just thinking about is Lisa Leslie. She's been much more open about, um, you know, speaking out against these racial injustices that have been happening. And of course, on the court, she was part of the group that, you know, started the WNBA um, and has been influential ever since her career began. So. That's someone I look up to. Cha? Hello, everyone. Um, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Shaida Brown Williams, and I'm a 1998 graduate from Duke University and had the great opportunity to play with Missy West. And uh, just so excited about what this has to offer. Um, I'm, I majored in math with a minor in theology. so. A little bit of science and a little bit of God. And so that kind of sums up just how I live my life. But just so excited to share with you today um, our experiences and, and what we know and what we can hopefully impact and impart into your lives. Um, my role model is actually my mother. So many of you may not know her, but her name is Carolyn Brown. And she was an amazing, uh, is an amazing teacher, continues to teach. But she taught during segregation and taught us so much about the, uh, the Black experience in America. So we are excited to be with you today. Thanks, Shah. Jen? Hi, everyone. Again, Missy, Colleen, thanks. Fellow panelists, truly honored and humbled to have this opportunity to speak uh, about this really important topic. Uh, my name is Jen Hall. I actually grew up with Missy in upstate New York. Um, so I'm originally from Malone. I currently live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I serve as the Senior Director of Major and Plan Gifts at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. I am married to a black man and have uh, three children. Uh, for me, my role model, uh, I would not be able to be even present on this panel or probably even being a viewer on this panel if it wasn't for my husband, uh, who made me realize how much I actually didn't know um, and how it's given me the opportunity to learn, grow, and educate uh, and help be a part of the change that is needed. Peppy. Thanks, Jen. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, likewise, it is also a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Peppy Brown Armstrong, uh, class of 2000 at Duke, actually part of the same recruiting class as Missy. And um, I majored in uh, biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, and biological anthropology and anatomy while there. I uh, have uh, degrees from other universities, even the one that's a little bit further down the road. Uh, everybody at some point has gotten my money, Wake Forest included, and NC State. We won't get into that. Um, right now, I am, uh, I work for IBM currently, and um, I own a medical practice with my husband, uh, as well as uh, I'm starting up a, another company. I can't seem to sit still. Uh, we'll probably uh, talk a little bit about that later, but it has to do with data analytics for uh, student athletes use. Um, I, as a role model, um, I actually, well, let me preface it by saying I played basketball and soccer my entire life growing up. Those are the only two sports I really played seriously. Um, you know, that's how my family, or to say specifically, my dad came to this country on a, on a, on a soccer scholarship. So that is pretty much all we knew. Um, so from a, from a role model, you know, not only was my dad my role model, but um, if you're looking for a role model just outside of the US, Pele was my role model. Um, uh, he has had some, I mean, quite extraordinary experiences. So, you know, just to have another vantage point of what it is uh, to be black in a whole different other country and a whole different other context, uh, I think would be a, a good thing to look at. And even, you know, domestically, uh, I think Tamika Catchings is a great role model. I uh, played with her a couple times as well. So if you don't follow her, I would highly suggest it uh, as well. Again, uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Peppy. Ro. Uh, why you had to put me last? That's hard to follow those amazing women, um, but I'll try. <laughs> uh, my name is Rochelle Parent. I am a graduate of Duke University, class of 2001. I studied religion and visual arts. Um, I tried to taste the coattails of a lot of these women. And uh, once Elizabeth came along, I realized that I should probably stop playing basketball. Um, and I am the assistant director of transportation for the city of Durham, North Carolina. Um, and the reason that I work in uh, transportation and mobility is because I care about accessibility and, and leveling the playing field and using mobility and transportation to do so. Um, so I'm excited to have just joined that team and be a part um, of that. In terms of role models, I think I always just kind of start real close to me as both of my parents. Um, but if anyone like just looked at it on the face, I'm a lot like my dad. Um, and I pay attention to what he says. He's been a great mentor, a great leader, a great teacher first and foremost. Um, and so I feel like if uh, I make a decision and I think what would dad do, I'll probably make the right decision. And so um, that's where I'm coming from. I'm excited to talk with all of these, everyone here and attendees as well. And we hope to even follow up afterwards if necessary. All right, awesome. So now we're getting into the heart of it. Um, Let's go around the room and we're going to share, um, each of you, share with us a personal story. Uh, you know, when you felt racially discriminated, how old were you? What did that feel like? How did it make you feel? Um, and let's, you know, start right in with Elizabeth, um, if you don't mind sharing an experience that you've had. Yeah, um, so my first experience with you know, racial discrimination. I was only eight years old. I had just moved to Virginia Beach. My family just moved to Virginia Beach. So I was going to a new elementary school. Um, and I was riding a bus, just like everybody else. And I remember these two kids uh, specifically were just kind of, you know, joking, making fun of me. And, you know, they would, they would open the window and spit outside and spit on the ground and say like, oh, like, let's pretend that's Elizabeth basically saying like the black asphalt was like comparable to me. And so for me, um, especially being that young, you know, that's something that sticks with you. And it also pushed me to want to be the best in everything, you know, not to let that type of language and, and the words that they use to, um, to describe me to like be meaningful. So for me, I wanted to be the best at everything, whether it was school, whether it was sports, um, and to, to not let that define me in any way. 
Shaw? Yeah, um, one that stands out to me, and it wasn't my first incident, but um, in high school, was a multi-sport athlete and actually was the only black on our high school softball team. And I remember an experience of just great times with my coaches, great times with my, my teammates, with the fans, um, even won a state championship with that team. But I remember my freshman year, one particular time, a, a teammate's mother came up to me and, you know, Shaw, you're so special and you're not like the rest of them. And I think based on the look on my face, she understood that I took that comment as, you know, condescending and kind of offensive. And my parents taught me to be respectful. So my response was just, you know, well, thank you. But my parents raised my siblings and myself to work hard just as they do. And I've internalized that, that comment for a while just to understand that at that moment, I decided that I never had and I never will suppress my blackness because it's who I am. But it also taught me to understand that even some of the best intentions can be rooted in racism and in bias and will continue to, to teach others and share what we know and who we are. Um, but I do realize that I'm eternally black and God has made us multifaceted. So I think until we get to know people outside of looking at their skin color, then we can learn so much about those gifts and skills that others have to present. Happy. Yeah, so uh, with Shaw, I wouldn't say that this is probably my first, wasn't my first occurrence, but um, one that did stick out to me, this was actually um, in 99 while at Duke. Um, you know, we we're all celebrating everybody, you know, both the men and women going to the final four first time, everybody celebrating great. And so there were a lot of uh, cameras, reporters, everything, everybody was on campus. And, uh, you know, of course I had my gear on and uh, just, walk, just walking, I don't know if it was, I don't remember if it was two science drive or two camera and I don't know it's a blur because you know I'm just running back and forth between those two places all the time as I'm sure all the rest of my teammates can attest to but I got stopped by a reporter and I don't even remember what for but the conversation went to you know you know what's your major in school and I told him I'm not gonna repeat it because I said it earlier but uh, and he flat out did not believe me uh, and said I was lying about, uh, you know, having three majors, not only that, having those majors. And well, you know, my reply was, well, why would I lie about something like that? I mean, what's the point? It's actually also in the, uh, in the book that I have those three majors. So there's, you could look it up, you could Google it. I mean, Google was a, still a thing back in the uh, early, uh, late 90s. Uh, and it took somebody else to kind of come in, another, another student, to come into the conversation and basically verify the fact that, you know, yes, I actually, you know, did have a brain and, uh, you know, could also play the game of basketball. Uh, you know, again, coming from someone who you know, I'm sure has talked to very many athletes, you know, throughout his day, I found that not only disturbing, but also kind of surprising. Uh, so, you know, in that regard, uh, kind of moving forward from there, it's been my uh, distinct uh, honor, pleasure to make sure that I'm always representing and, and having at least a voice for those, you know, athletes, because there's so many of us that uh, not only play our sport well, but also uh, strive to get education. Happy, can you share with us, uh, we have a train coming through. Um, I live in downtown Tampa and the train is coming through. Uh, so I apologize if you hear it, but Peppy, can you share also that experience that you had with that uh, AAU team recently? Oh, sure. So uh, this was actually, we were at uh, AAU Nationals. I believe I was about 12. And I wouldn't say, I mean, actually, it's a good point, uh, Missy. I wouldn't say this is necessarily racism. I think it was just more of a shock to me. Um, yeah, I grew up just outside of D.C., so there were all different types of people from all over the world 
uh, you know, obviously you have the embassies, you know, the president, everybody. There's so many people you can come in contact with and so many different uh, nationalities of people you can come in contact with in DC. So uh, during that AU national championship, we were in Florida in Orlando and, uh, you know, in our hotel, I uh, came across a team that, uh, you know, after talking, they said they had never actually met a black person in person before. You know, again, we're all 11 and 12, but you know, to me, I was like, are you serious? You've never, like ever? They're like, no, we, we've only seen, you know, the only time we've seen a black person is on television. And so I was like, well, okay, well, here's some of the things, you know, we do, we learn and, you know, we, you know, we had, uh, we had a great time. I mean, I think uh, uh, pen pals for a while actually with some of them, but uh, you know, even something as simple as teaching them, you know, how to play spades, not that that's necessarily a quintessential black thing, but it's something that, you know, I know how to do. I'm halfway decent at it, you know, so, um, and I think also taught, uh, taught them what the electric slide was, which was kind of interesting, but, uh, you know, again, I don't think that was necessarily like a racism thing, but it's just something that opened my eyes just to the fact that, you know, some people just don't have that experience, right? And it's not that they're not willing to learn, they just need to be exposed to it. Awesome, thank you, Pepe. Jen? I am white and therefore personally have never experienced racism. I do recall the first time where I witnessed it uh, towards my husband and family. I grew up on the New York Canadian border and I have crossed the border hundreds of times, maybe even thousands if I think, or at least a thousand if I think about it. Uh, and the time when I was with my family returning into the United States, uh, the border patrol officer at, and my husband was driving, asked my husband questions I had never received, never received. Um, and asked him to produce documentation that I have never been asked to produce along with my children. And we were detained. And having had this experience many times, that was the first time I realized that because the color of my skin, I am treated differently and that I clearly benefit from white privilege. Uh, to add to that, my brother and his family were in the car directly behind us and went through the border no, no slower than 30 seconds. I'm pretty sure they said, hi, where, are you, where were you going? Where are you coming from? And, and he went on his way. So that was the first time me personally experienced uh, racism for, for my husband, certainly my kids. I'm gonna jump right to you, Rel. Oh, yeah, kind of like um, maybe Pepe and, and, and Shaw, I won't go all the way back. I, I, I grew up in Akron, Ohio. My parents moved us to uh, a suburb called Copley that um, was predominantly white uh, so that we could have a better opportunity at school systems, which is you know, what they believed at the time. And um, so I've been called the N-word a million times, so I, I got desensitized to that at some point. Um, but one of the things that stood out to me is a little bit older is after I graduated from college, I was with a friend who was driving and we were in central Ohio um, and she got pulled over for speeding and she was white and I was in the passenger seat and the cop pulled us over and he asked for both of our IDs and she wanted to make a big deal about it. And I was like, just leave it alone. Just don't make a big deal about this. Um, and, you know, I gave him my, my ID and of course I had nothing on my record or anything that could have got me arrested but I knew that like that those were my rights to actually not have to produce that um and she couldn't understand why I would just do that and I just kind of told her that the outcome the risk of the outcome for this is significantly different for me than for you and honestly like the risk of the outcome for you being with me is significantly different and you don't realize that um and so that's something that stood out to me and that's why I, I, I focus more and pay more attention to systemic racism than I do just overt racism. I live in North Carolina. If I see a Confederate flag at someone's house, I'm probably not gonna go to their house and ask them for some butter. Um, but at the same time, it's more of the getting passed over um, in promotions or um, just like the subversive things that really bother me or the things that I want to change like in our system 
that prohibit us from advancing. Um, that is kind of like my focus. Yeah, and Jen, let's go back to you for a minute. Um, so I know when we talked uh, on Tuesday, you talked quite a bit about white privilege and what that means. Do you mind touching on that just briefly um, and explaining that to us? Sure. Um, white privilege, um, as I noted, I, I think I realized it was the first time when I crossed the border that I think the effect of white privilege had on me. And to follow on what Ro just said, um, systemic racism is, you know, the 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 byproduct of white privilege. And it's not, it's not that you're not working just as hard as somebody else. It's not that you as a white person are actually of privilege and means. It is that because the color of your skin, you are afforded opportunities that others are not simply because of one thing, and that is because you are white. Nothing else is the difference. It's that you happen to grow up white um, and so that you can go to a supermarket and or, or a pharmacy and find products that match you, that you can find hair care products, that you can find Band-Aids that match your skin tone, that when my husband and I went to get a house loan with identical credit scores, I got a better rate than my husband. That is white privilege. That is a part of and as a result of systemic racism. And it has nothing to do, and I think white people probably have a hard time because white are never categorized by race. And so for the word white privilege, it is shocking because we're never, we're never looked at as a collective of white. And then privilege, people think, I don't come from privilege. I work really hard. I am poor. I, I don't have a huge means. And it has nothing to do about accumulation of wealth. And it has everything to do with the fact that you have the ability to access resources just because the color of your skin. Yeah, Colleen, did you want to mention, did you want to say anything to follow up on that? Well, I think we're still focused on Peppy, so we have to change the screen up, I think. <laughs> I'm getting some feedback. It's okay. Um, it, well, one of the things that really struck me, and, and I am a student of history, I, I love history. Uh, when I was younger, and I am the, the oldest of this uh, panel uh, by quite a bit, uh, we had one TV in the living room and my father controlled uh, the dial and it was public broadcasting system. And at a, long, a young age, I was understanding how important history was. And I thought that I had a great understanding in, in it, having read Uncle Tom's Cabin, having watched Ken Burns' Civil War several times. And I heard a historian say, if you don't know the Civil War, you don't know America. And so when all of this started to happen, I thought well, I was well informed. But it didn't dawn on me how thoughtful Black Americans are before they leave the house, going for a run, the time of day, the city they're in. As a woman, I do think about that, I'll be honest with you. I am very cautious. I never wear headphones, et cetera, but it's a different experience. And so even though I historically knew events, I had an understanding of the black experience versus the white experience. I didn't have an understanding of today of their everyday experience, not just the history, but the things they tell their children. Um, the only rule I had growing up is be home before the lights go on or when the street lights come on, get home. You know, I didn't have my parents tell me how to act if a, a policeman pulls me over, et cetera. So that's white privilege too. And I have a lot to learn there. I've learned so much in the last few weeks and I thought I was well informed. And I think that's what these forums are about is we think we understand, even those that love history and understand it, uh, have read it and respect people's positions and experiences. I don't experience that. I don't have to think the way, you know, my black neighbors do when they leave the house. So I think that alone, I've worked hard, believe me, for everything I've had, uh, but I still have white privilege because I'm white. And I, I think it, it enrages people. It causes an emotion that we need to understand what it means objectively and so that we can have a discussion about it. So thank you, Jen, for sharing that. Shaw, let me turn to you. Um, let's talk about George Floyd and kind of what happened 
really in the world uh, when he was, was murdered not too long ago. Uh, yes, and it's something that I have, you know, given a lot of thought to. And on May 25th, with the, the murder of George Floyd, I think it brought a renewed, it brought renewed attention to the ongoing concerns about the, uh, the racism in our, in our criminal justice system. And not only were we dealing with that, but we're in a pandemic where the lives of families and friends were lost. Uh, essential workers are stressed out because they're on the front line. The economy is down. There's tension. And all of that almost created the perfect storm for when this murder occurred before the world, that our lives were impacted. And I will be honest with you that I felt anger. I felt grief. I felt every emotion that I could possibly feel in the matter of hours. And this is also on the, the tail end of Ahmaud Arbery being murdered for jogging. Breonna Taylor murdered sleeping in her home. So Americans were grieving, but particularly Black Americans. And many experiences that I felt like I experienced, I think many others, were the stages of grief, you know, from denial. Like this, this really didn't happen again, to anger, to bargaining, to depression, to acceptance. And now we're in a, in a stage of, I, of hope that this can change. And I think despite what we're told, and there's no manual on grieving. Sometimes we say, these are, the, these are the stages you have to go in. I think different people felt different stages. And why I may not agree with the rioting and with the looting, I do understand that because anger is a part of grieving, because at some point, enough is enough, that's the way that, that some people have expressed themselves. And so um, we've often, we're often told that time heals all wounds. And I'm not a believer in that statement because I don't think that the wound can heal if you don't address that there is actually a wound. So if we look at the, the order of, of healing and of, uh, the first thing is that you have to acknowledge that the wound exists. So I, I think with George Floyd, it caused America to stop and say, for eight minutes and 45 seconds, we witnessed that there is a racial divide and there's something that exists. And it's not just, it doesn't just stop at br police brutality, but it's, it's something that was allowed. Um, and I think in order for that wound to heal, then you have to apply pressure. And that's where we are right now, is that we're applying the pressure to the wound to say that we have to do something about this. We have to have these discussions. We have to see laws change. Things have to be done differently. And then after applying the pressure, we also have to clean the wound. And that means there's some things in our, in our government, in our local state offices that have to change. And lastly, once we cover that wound, it has to be covered with a sterile bandage. There's nothing like putting on, so it's got to be clean, it's got to have ointment, there must be things that we must do to make sure that as this wound heals, and it will take time, but we have to acknowledge that the wound is there and, uh, and continue to watch out for infection and things that can cause those, those wounds to you know, bleed again or, or resurface. And then there's amputation and other things that come along with it. So I think that May 25th um, incident just woke, woke the world up to what we have to ha do. And that's having a discussion like this today. Thank you, Shaw. Um, Ro, you mentioned we had a, a call separate uh, yesterday and you shared with me a story about taking your daughter to a gas station um, kind of around the protest time. Will you share that experience with us and kind of what you shared with your daughter? Yes, yeah, sir. Um, I worked a lot during the week and so I don't get a chance to spend a lot of time with her during the week and so every weekend I at least try and take her on a walk and we'll go for like an hour or two and we'll walk the wall we'll stop at a convenience store and pick up some snacks on the way home and sit at the park and talk before we came home and we we're at the convenience store we pick up snacks and we we're <clears throat> on our way to the park and one of the uh, peaceful protesters came down the street and just advised me said they just started breaking windows and dropping tear gas and so I started yelling at Lena get in the car it's time to go we gotta go get in the car and She's a, an inquisitive little girl. and She stops in the middle of the sidewalk. It's like, why, mommy? Like, why do we have to run now? Like, why do we have to, like, go get in the car? 
I was like, explain it to you when we get in the van. <laughs> um, and what I said to her on, on the way home is that we don't, kind of like Shaw was alluding to, um, we try not to, to make up fables for her to understand things. We try to tell her the truth. Like she knows the anatomy of our bodies. Like she knows the name of those parts, right? Um, and so I just said, look, a black man was killed by a police officer who happened to be white. Um, and what happened to him was not, death was not a justifiable answer to what happened, what, what he was accused of. And people are upset because it's not the first time that it happened. Um, and it's happened repeatedly and people are just kind of tired. And finally, thank God I got home and my partner's there because she's far more eloquent than I am. <laughs> um, and because by the time we got home, Lena said, are all police bad? Are all white police officers bad? And that was not the message I was trying to get across. And what Asante said to her was, look, there are good and bad people who can dress up in any uniform. Sometimes they dress up as police, sometimes it's firemen, sometimes it's the clerk at the store. It could be a school teacher, it could be anything, right? But what we have to change is that we have to pay attention to when there are bad people and try and fix that. And then we pay a particular attention to people who are dressed up in uniforms to have a fiduciary um, responsibility to us. She didn't say fiduciary, but you know, she said they have a responsibility or expectation that they're there to do something good for us and to help. And so they have a higher standard. Um, and so that's why everybody's upset. And we'll go from that. And then Colleen, you, you can ask the next, next question, but you know, one of the questions that our audience asked was, you know, after George Floyd, um, if you're watching the news, you hear a lot about the police. And so now police who are good police, right, are feeling like they have to defend themselves. I know I have family in law enforcement, uh, my brother's in law enforcement. And so can you help explain to those, you know, officers, um, can you understand, can you just talk about this racism and its depth beyond, you know, good and bad law enforcement? I know Shaw, you know, your husband's in law enforcement. Maybe you can just touch on that briefly. Absolutely. Uh, I think racism and social inequality, it runs deep. And, you know, unfortunately, and I, I, it's exactly what Rose said, um, because we'll just use the term good, bad. They're good cops, they're bad cops. They're I'm, I'm, I'm in athletics and on the college stuff. They're good coaches, they're bad coaches. I think there's good administration, bad administration. So I think the main thing is that we continue to, uh, to teach our children and to teach them that there's a decision that you have to make. And I, I think the two things I would line up with is we must operate in spirit and in truth. And if that spirit is a spirit of love and motivated by goodness, then we're good. Truth doesn't always equal facts because there's some facts that have happened in our country that were not lined up with the truth. So I think that we can continue to, to teach them and guide them. Like I said, my husband's a policeman. He's a black policeman. So, you know, each day, despite the color of his skin, that's still a challenge that he is faced with every day now. Do I police the black neighborhood? Because maybe some of the white police feel afraid uh, because of the defunding, because of the escalation of emotions right now. So that's something that we continue to, uh, to talk about, share with our 14 year old son that you are a black man and there's certain ways you must carry yourself. But I think because racism does run so deeply, um, we'll see it in all, all arenas of life until we can address it and just again, stand on that truth and, and denounce racism. Yeah, thank you, Sha. You know, this is, I'm totally ad-libbing right now, but it's so important because, you know, you mentioned that racism is systemic. This is not just about George Floyd. This is not just about an event, one event. And I think about the contribution of Black America because they're saying we're tired. Like, what else do we have to do to earn equal rights? And back in the 60s, when Martin Luther King marched in the streets, 1965 and I wasn't born too far after that. They were marching in the streets to vote. They wanted to vote. It was 1965, I was born in 1971. The Vietnam War was going on and 
another athlete stood up and said, I'm not going there. His name is Muhammad Ali. And I'm not going to quote him, but his idea was, I'm a black man in America, and you want me to fight next to, you know, white brothers of America, but I can't sit down and have a meal with him when I come home. I can't share a water fountain with him when I come home. Black Americans fought in the Revolutionary War, 7,000 of them. And over 180,000 Black Americans fought in the Civil War. And the, although the Emancipation Proclamation did not promise that they would be free, the hope was, if I fight with you and we become one union under one flag, that's liberty, home of the brave. And then that war ended and they weren't free. And so I, I always say, do your homework. And this has been going on a long time. If you want me to fight for democracy and then come home and I don't have it, there's something wrong there. And we're not taught that in schools. I can't blame a lot of Americans for it because as you mentioned, Shah, the truth has to be found. You gotta do research to find the truth. And this is a historical moment right now. We will be on one side of history, all of us as individuals. 10 years, 20 years from now, we're gonna look back at ourselves and say, was I on the right side of history? Because I remember watching those shows with my father. Uh, he, it'd be two years tomorrow that he passed away. And when we talked about people we admire, my dad was not a perfect man, but he certainly made me a great daughter and a great person. And I wondered what side I would be on. And I assumed where I would be. I know where I am now. And I think as individuals, we need to make decisions moving forward that we will educate and help educate others. And at the very least, to be kind. So thank you, Shah, so much. So let's move on to Elizabeth. You know, the question that we're getting is, so what can we do now? All of these people of different communities. And we recognize that in some communities, there just aren't any, you know, black neighbors. So, you know, Elizabeth, can you give us some ideas what even people can do in white communities, schools, sports teams to start moving us in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, it starts with a conversation. Um, not always the easiest conversation to have but I think even more so now like there's a likelihood you'll have at least one black teammate or you'll be around at least one black person and you stepping out and having just a normal conversation and then being able to ask some tougher questions I think that alone can start something that's really important because at that point sometimes they might hear or see something that they had never even thought of um, and I think like, especially from an athlete perspective, um, we have a unique platform where our voices are listened to just, I mean, we're just out there a little bit more. Um, and so whether that's like, you know, in posting on social media and sharing resources, sharing articles, podcasts, like things like that, um, I think people are more willing to listen, uh, now more than ever before. And so being able first to start with a conversation and then, you know, letting that lead to some type of resource. And then I think that in turn will, you know, create some type of action. Um, yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. Jen? I think to follow on what Elizabeth said is we are going to be part of conversations and we have to listen and then we have to speak up. So there is an opportunity for us with our friends, with our colleagues, uh, and with our family. So racism is learned and taught generation from generation. You know, Colleen mentioned how it's, how it's taught in education, which is only part of the story. So we have to speak up. We, as white people, have to speak up when we see that the conversation is negative or is hurtful to black people. So if your grandmother, if your brother, if your sister, if your colleague, if your teammate says something, you have to stop, step up and say it's not right. Now, what you may say is, I don't know the right answers. I don't know all the information. I know it's not right. And that's all you need to know. You need to say, stop, just stop. Um, because the second you take to say stop, your child watching you, your colleague watching you, your teammate next to you saw that you had the courage to do it, 
You may not have known all the answers, but then you're giving them the courage to do it when they see it too. So that it's on us to make sure that we stop this with our generation by interjecting and saying, stop, that that is not okay. That is not right. You cannot treat people this way. No, not all black people are X. And as I said, you don't need to know the right answer, but you need to step up and stop it from happening. And so it's action. You know, Elizabeth said conversation, be a part of the conversation and be the part that stops the conversation from continuing when it is not productive conversation. That's really great, Jen. Thank you. Shah? Um, yeah, again, being on the, on the college level, you know, we've asked ourselves, what can we do with our collegiate athletes? Because we do have a voice in the community. And um, for running basketball camps, I see the impact that our young people um, have on the kids that come in. And when they come in, they just want to learn the game. So it's amazing that God has given us a basketball as our ministry to, to teach young people not only about life and what you all are doing going beyond the game, but how we can also teach them that, that we're all created equal. And you know, I think it's important that we denounce racism, not just by saying, oh, let's not say that, let's not do this. But I think when you denounce it, you also have to say that we all have equal rights and that I'm no more important than you just simply because of the, the color of my skin. So we are, you know, we're doing Zoom calls and we're listening to the, the heart of our athletes. But I think it's important that we give them that platform that we listen. And you know, so many times we, we talk, 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 but they have expressed themselves. And I was on a, on a call last week where, you know, some college coaches were just sharing their hearts. And, you know, a few things were said that I kind of been thinking about, hey, why always take the all black team to a black school and I do understand because you can show them role models but I think it's also important that we take it take them into an all-white school where now these white students can see that hey these are black role models these are some like Pepe said there's some that have never come in contact or have relationships with blacks so let me be the first to, to show you something different you know go to each other's churches just share different experiences exposure is an amazing teacher. So the more we can expose our student athletes, the more that we can can challenge them to to hang out with some donors, to do you know, just be with people that maybe they haven't been in that um, that atmosphere with, and that would help us in our in our learning process. Thanks, Sean. Miss. Yeah. So what I wanted to share as a college coach, and now doing what we do at Beyond the Game Academy, and in the midst of COVID. You know, what is it that we can do right now? And one of the things that we have been doing is things like this, right? Using our platforms to connect, to speak about these things. But we have a lot of coaches, high school youth coaches uh, joining us this evening. And they're thinking, you know, what can I do right now when I can't go out, you know, and physically be in front of my kids? It's as simple as holding a Zoom call and saying, okay, you know, let's talk about George Floyd and what happened and what's going on and have an open discussion. And it doesn't mean like Jen said, you have to have all the answers. But right now, we as, you know, as a white person, I feel it's my responsibility to get the conversation going, to start talking about it. So we start feeling more comfortable talking about it. I think a lot of times where I have, when I haven't said anything, it's because I've been scared. I don't know. You know, I've learned more about you know, the history of America in the last four weeks than I have my entire life because I refuse to stay silent moving forward. And I've been silent because I haven't educated myself, right? And now that I have, it's like, okay, there's little things that I can do. I might not have all the answers, but I can have a Zoom call with my team and say, let's talk about this. You know, what do you guys feel? What are some things that you're thinking about and then just kind of let them process it where they have an adult kind of, you know, just being present with them. I think if we just start the conversation where they can start to open up and feel comfortable talking about it. And like for me, you know, I'm always, a, I, I have this fear of saying the wrong thing. You know, I've, I'm in such a comfortable environment with all of you guys because you guys are such great friends uh, to me. And I know if I say something wrong, you guys will check myself, you know, real quick. But I think a lot of us, you know, a lot of our students are afraid. 
And I think a lot of our adults are afraid, but it's like, when do we as a, a, as a white person say, okay, that's no longer ex an excuse not to start the conversation, not to have the conversation, not to open it up to our student athletes. So I would encourage, you know, these Zoom calls, being uncomfortable as a coach with your athletes uh, and just having that conversation. Also, Shaw, you said bringing, you know, uh, uh, African Americans into, you know, white schools, white churches, you know, having a guest speaker. It's as simply as having one person, you know, instead of having just a motivational speaker, bring in an African American motivational speaker so they can see, you know, this person inspire and uplift and you're like, wow, you know, I want to be like that. And it changes perspective, it changes thought, it changes conversation, it, right, it, it brings about questioning. And we need to start encouraging that. And so it's not, you know, these drastic things, it's little things. But we, I think, as, as, a, as a white Mer American need to start stepping up to the plate and doing our part. Thanks, Miss. Ro. I'm always going to be like the controversial person in the room. <laughs> I told this story on, on, on Tuesday um, when um, everything kind of went down and, and the riots were going on. I had like four or five of my white friends text me like, Ro, what should we do? Like, what, what can we do to help? And my first inclination was to be super cynical and to just say in my head, like, this is not the first black person that has died at the hands of the police. <laughs> like, this is not the first time this is happening. Like, why now, right? Um, but I realized that there's a responsibility on both sides um, as a black person to not be cynical um, and to someone's willing to have a conversation with me now to have it. But the onus that I, or the charge that I put out to all of my friends is that this should not be one conversation. It should be a continued conversation that's followed by action. Um, and so that's kind of where I lean and I kind of, the thought in my mind is like to listen and learn and educate and Missy touched on it a bit as well like I, I was telling him um, on Tuesday when we we're doing a run through here that I didn't learn about uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa until about like six or seven years ago that's unfortunate I should know my history right and I had to research it and find it out um, and so but we all have to do that it's not just up to black people it's not just up to white people it's up to all of us to understand um, what ha happened, what can happen and understand our laws so that when we are educating our next generation that we're telling them the truth, we're telling them reality. Like I just learned today um, of a law that's called qualified immunity where the police have a certain, le a different level of immunity and certain political f or elected officials have a different level of immunity than a normal citizen. And shoot, I might have it now because I work for the city of Durham and it's crazy. <laughs> but it makes it really, really difficult to prosecute a police officer for the same offense that if a civilian did it, um, uh, that they would have different repercussions, um, you know, for those those results. And so, I think again, like I think the onus is on all of us to to educate ourselves, to continue the conversation um, on our side, to try not to be cynical um, on white people's side, to try not let to let your guilt like overwhelm you to do nothing <laughs> um, and I think we can work together and continue that conversation. I agree. Thanks, Ro. Happy. Well, sort of tied to that, uh, Jen Rosati actually in the Q&A, and I don't know if anybody can, hopefully everybody can see the Q&A, uh, had a question I replied to her, sort of related to the questions you'd asked, but uh, uh, and, and I agree with everybody that uh, has spoken before, the main thing is trust. Um, without that, as part of any conversation, whether it be, you know, with your, with your family, with your friends, which you may inherently trust, but with your teammates, with your, uh, you know, teachers, professors, maybe even, you know, you never know, you know, when a conversation like this could occur, but uh, you have to be able to talk and have that level of trust so that people are truly willing to learn um, and willing to listen. Uh, I think for a little while now, unfortunately, uh, within the past couple of years, we've really have sort of stopped 
just general talking to each other. It's more yelling <laughs> as opposed to an actual conversation. And we, we really have to get back to that if we're going to uh, get anywhere, you know, to be perfectly honest. So I, I, trust is, is everything in, in every relationship, uh, in every category, I 100% agree and you know one thing that i will say about what we can do today and i've already said it once is do your homework uh, so many people of every age but particularly our young people are creating their beliefs based on facebook posts from what they see in the news or what they hear someone in their household says and that's that's it and i'm asking this audience and, and everyone that you can touch in this audience it's okay to have a difference of opinion but I, I want you to be able to debate me. Be sure, specifically if you're gonna post it on Facebook, because I can assure you that, that that is your resume now. And unfortunately for kids and as coaches, you know, you're on their Facebook before you recruit them. You wanna see what kind of character they have. And you get caught up maybe in someone else's fever of opinions and you say something that 10 years from now is just not who you are because you didn't do your homework. And right now, don't put something out there you're not sure about. And there are a lot of differences of opinion if you're putting all of your opinions or basing them on the local news or whatever station maybe your parents watch or maybe Facebook, which is just usually friends that have similar beliefs. I'm asking you now to please go beyond the Facebook posts, pick up your phone my age i'd have to walk down to the library pick up a encyclopedia britannica and start i mean i didn't even know how to use the library cards like right now you pick up the phone everything you want to learn go to the history channel if you're not sure go to the history channel they'll have the statistics double check it with another source to say is this right because when i see something that just doesn't make sense to me like a man at the the top of his career like muhammad ali or Kaepernick and he takes a knee and I say, well, why, why would he give up all of that? He doesn't just want me to look at him on a knee. He wants me to do some research. He wants me to start thinking because he's willing to give up his career to do that. Muhammad Ali did the same thing. He lost everything, but he was making a statement about, let's look at ourselves first, America. Let's look at my experience here. I'm willing to give up everything. I'm the greatest in the world, the most world recognized human being at the time. And he was willing to do that. So I ask you to do your homework. And if you still disagree, that's okay. But it's an educated argument. Do that for you. Or else you might say something that you may regret when you know better. And so real quick. Uh, well, hold, hold on, Colleen. I'm going to, uh, I want to ask this question because I don't know if everybody can see the question that was just asked to us. But maybe somebody on the panel can answer this. Maybe uh, Shaw at LSU. Let's see. So if you were in college right now, what support pla or, or a platform would you want as a student athlete from your coaches and athletic department? And then what would you do with that platform? Hmm. Um, I think as a student athlete, you just want the platform to be, to be heard, to know that you have the, the respect of your administration. I think it's very important that and we may have some ADs on this call. I think it's important that our athletic directors are not just seen as, you know, the big man or the big woman on, on the top of the hill, but now they're going into practices and they're going into the facilities to actually build relationships. You know, PEP is trust. Can we trust our administration? Can we trust our coaches? Can we trust that they have our best interest? And that um, when these incidences do occur, whether it be based on race or classism, whatever it is, they want that platform. And as a student athlete, I would want that platform to know that, hey, they, you know, they have my back. So. <laughs> Am I going this? All right. So real quick, everyone, uh, if you want to give us a resource to help us educate ourselves um, that we can actually compile we, Missy and I, obviously, we have the Beyond the Game website and then Facebook, and we're going to offer it to everyone who's registered. We're going to compile some of these resources so that you can bring them to your home, et cetera. Uh, so, Pepe, do you want to go first? 
Sure. Um, I will, uh, we, as part of the Tuesday's uh, conversation, uh, I think one of the questions, you know, one of the questions we had, uh, or topics we talked about is whether or not we say Black or African American. Um, so uh, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because the reference that I would like to provide to you all is the Genographic Project by uh, National Geographic. Uh, so just so everybody knows sort of, you know, my two cents answer to it. Um, and it'll make sense once you read or lead or listen uh, uh, more about what the National Geographic was trying to do. Uh, personally, uh, you know, again, race or colors or white, black, and so on and so forth. I mean, that was something that was made up by humans. Uh, the anthropologist in me says, you know, black is a more accurate, not the best, but it's the more accurate term than African American because technically everyone on this earth is African, well, not on this earth, but every US American citizen is actually technically an African American. And it will make sense again, if you were able to um, uh, watch that. I think it was, uh, it was something that I had known again, just from my previous studies. But if you have not had any foray or any um, inkling about what anthropology, or at least this side of anthropology is, I would highly recommend uh, that resource. Pepe, I think it's a huge resource because I spoken to several people after you and they're like, definitely African American. I'm like, I got to tell these girls that I'm getting mixed signals here. So I'm like, <laughs> it's to make everybody happy because I totally get the anthropology approach and then others think that black is slang. And I'm like, I kind of see that too. So that's yeah. the things we need to talk about. I mean, I didn't know these things until we discussed it. So I appreciate that. Elizabeth, what do you have to suggest? Oh, wait, miss, you got Yeah, just give me one second. So as Colin kind of touched on, what we would like um, is the audience. Any resources that you are using currently, it doesn't matter if it's a movie, a documentary, a book, a children's book, please right now, as we're going through this, hit up the chat mm -hmm. with those resources. And what uh, I'm going to do is compile all these resources from all of you. And if you can help us with this, it would be awesome. I'm going to follow, send all of you a follow-up email with all of these resources so we have them to use in our schools, to, have, to use in within, within our families. But if you can start hitting up the chat with those resources, we'd be very, very grateful. So go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay, for my Netflix watchers, I would suggest the 13th and uh, something a book that goes really well with that is the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Uh, I read it in undergrad actually, but I think both of those are great resources in understanding um, how mass incarceration has been like it, kind of like how it started um, in the black community and the effects that it's had, and specifically like from the Thirteenth Amendment. You know, that's basically saying. Slavery, yes, slavery is abolished, but in the case of um, like prison or like basically like you can use slavery if somebody is arrested. And so like kind of how mass incarceration has started from that and affected predominantly black men. Um, so those are two great resources. Yeah, let me say to the audience, because we have kids, uh, parents, we have different age groups, like some of these parents, you need to take a look to make sure it's age appropriate. No, 13th, uh, one of my teammates just watched it and said, maybe my younger son was too young, but this is history. I and mean, when we got to talk about our history and it's almost too much to watch, it tells us a lot about our history, right? But I think those are great. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth Rowe. All right, so I'll give you something age appropriate. It just happens to be what my partner's reading to our daughter right now. It's a series called Polly Diamond, um, and she's a, a writer, and she makes all these stories. And um, and the reason I think it's in, things like that are important, or series like that are important, is because she's an African, she's a black girl, and um, I think sometimes we we miss just the point of like how we uh, allow commercialization um, to infiltrate. Um, our lives and don't integrate black gar Barbies or, you know, of different color or have books that have, you know, characters of a different skin color um, or a different ethnicity. 
uh, or language um, into our into our homes. And so um, that's a really good series that we like. I just recently started watching the Patriot Act um, on Netflix. It's a series by, I'm going to probably butcher his name, but it's Hassan Minaj, I think is how you say his last name. He's a comedian, but he does these stand-ups. And if you have a short attention span like me, it's good because the stand-ups are only about like 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, but they're full of, of facts. And he just did a recent one that I, I saw this morning um, where he talked about the George Floyd killing, not from the perspective of just black and white, but from the perspective of Asian and Muslim Americans and how they kind of stood by um, and disassociated themselves um, from the problem. So I thought that was really interesting, but that's a, a good series to, to catch up on. And just before Ro gets off that subject, uh, keep in mind, Hassan Minaj, he's great, but that is definitely for adults. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he uses the F word a lot. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's an adult thing. So you okay. Do that after you read Polly Diamond to your kids and they go to sleep, then you watch Patriot. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Peppy, for that. Uh, uh, Jen. Uh, one, I think that was actually already mentioned as well in the chat function is Project Implicit. Uh, which is a project at Harvard, and I recommend the skin tone and the race test. Uh, I think by taking this, uh, you cannot deny that you are racist, um, and it gives you a point of reference to where you can go. Um, and from someone who has taken it before my anti-racist work to after, you can see a change. Um, so for those who take it and may be afraid of the outcome, um, as I think all of these panelists have said, you have to be uncomfortable. Uh, so you're going to be uncomfortable with the results, but you have the ability to change um, and continue the conversation. And then most recently, I have toddlers, um, and Roe mentioned books, and I have lots of books, and I've certainly shared some of these resources with Colleen and Missy as well. Um, but the town hall CNN did with Elmo and Elmo's dad uh, was a great conversation on race and protests. Um, so some of those parents out there or anybody who just is, you know, wants an opportunity to understand it, I think there's a, a, a little clip of it. Um, and I think it certainly gives, um, gives a really good basis understanding of what's happening and certainly what racism is. I have four-year-olds. I showed it to them. Um, I've been, um, I think Rose said she talked with her kids at a very, very early age. And my kids, we do talk about race because um, we have to in our family. So they watch it, not that they had questions, um, but I think it's a great resource to just to have a opportunity to talk to kids about it, but also an easy opportunity um, for parents, educators to have to, to learn themselves. Hey Jen, we just got a question. Can you name that test? Um, oh, the Project Implicit. So if you Google Project Implicit, it's, um, I think it may be implicit.harvard.edu. Uh, but hopefully if you Google it, as Peppy said, we can Google everything. Um, but if you, and then you have to agree to take it, it's an anonymous test um, so that they're not collecting data on you as a person. So they're not gonna know Jen Hall is racist and that they're gonna come after you. So this is just data that's collected. Um, and then it's not that it comes out for you who are taking it, it doesn't come out you're racist. It just tells you your preference um, so that you may be preference towards Euro European European descent, which is, is clearly white, but um, it does give you a, a frame. So it's called Project Implicit by Harvard. Yeah, and uh, Jen, thank you for that. If I could just jump in um, and just like be a jerk as I usually am, again, Google is like the best thing in the world. And so if you wanna know anything, like that's what we have to do as well. And I wanna just make sure I put that out there that it's not that like, because we're black, we know all the resources or because Jen's married to a black man, she knows all the resources and you guys have just listed a, a ton of them. Um, but use the fact that we have an information age and there's a ton of information out there. If you want to know a topic, just Google it and just do your research to like Colleen would say, fact check it as you go along the way. Thanks, Ro. And Sha. Uh, one article that uh, I think it was early, uh, early this month, Dawn Staley. So just being on the college level, she actually had a great article in the Player Tribune. So that's something that I would recommend, uh, you know, for college coaches or collegiate uh, student athletes to, to read. And I think it also could help in high school. Um, 
Hidden, Hidden Figures is a movie that I loved just with the black women in Nassau. And I just think it's, it's important that our black young girls see something like that. And also just for all of us to know that there's so many contributions that we can make in so many different arenas. Um, I know we're all not, not because she's black, not because she played basketball, but we were all like jaw drop when Pepe told us her three majors. We're like, what are you doing? Not, but because of the, because of what it took for her just to be a, a basketball player at Duke University and what Gail Gesson Court required of us. We're like, so you sure you're going to do this? And it just encouraged all of us to know that whatever you put your mind to, that you can do it. So that is, uh, so Pepe, I have, I, I, I talk about you all the time because she is a stickler to it, but she was going to work hard on the court and, um, and in the classroom. So I think if we can talk about just those amazing black women that do those incredible things that, you know, sometimes we don't know how just a human can do it. So uh, Hidden Figures and also there's a Netflix uh, series called Dear White People. And so it just talks about actually being black at a predominantly white university. So I'm just always looking at different things going on in the college settings that could help us grow and learn. So the Dawn Staley article and Dear White People. And Peppy. And Peppy. Peppy. Look, yeah. I had y'all support. Y'all helped me, uh, you know, wake me up, you know, make sure I wasn't late. You know, I had the support of very great people. Put band-aids so, on all your injuries do from tripping over things, getting to right. the workouts. That's, that's right. I, I did not do it by myself. I will wholeheartedly admit that. I could not have done it without you all, you know, get my contest, get my knee pads. So, Y'all need to also thank yourselves because you did help too. So that's all I got to say about that. It takes a team. It takes a team. Right. Awesome. This, am, I, am I mentioning resources? Sure, go ahead. I could go on for days. So, you know, from a serious perspective, if you want to make a commitment, so Ro, I know you have a short attention span. You don't want to make this commitment. I truly do believe if you want to understand the United States of America, you have to understand the Civil War. And we just don't learn about it in school and maybe it is because it's it's difficult it, it's hard i think there's shame associated with it and people just want it to go away it's not going away and uh, i think people if they watch it's ken burns who i think is an american treasure quite honest you can watch anything that ken burns creates and you're going to learn the truth it's 13 episodes they're over an hour each it's a commitment i probably watched it not even kidding eight times over um that's one the other is Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And she's a white woman who was born in Connecticut. She was in Maine. I think she was 42 years old when she wrote this. And uh, most historians believe it was the catalyst to the Civil War. She sold over 3 million over time, but because at the time women were not supposed to speak in public, her brother spoke on her behalf. Yet she, she was invited to the White House by Abraham Lincoln. And he said, so you're the little woman who started this big war. So sometimes it takes women like tonight to get things going in the right direction. Uh, so those would be my two, again, huge commitment, very serious and content. You know, here's my white American, you know, suggestion of a movie. And it made me hopeful as a, as a white woman and that is the help. And it's, uh, it shows you how black women raised white kids. And then when those kids grew up, they continued to work for that child now as the help. And, uh, I watched it again recently with Missy. Selma is another movie. Again, if you don't want to commit to documentaries, in fact, like watch a movie and understand what these protests were about, who these people were, and that this wasn't ancient times. I mean, this wasn't the pyramids. People, your grandparents or parents were alive. I was alive while this was happening. And so those would be mine, Miss. And I could go on for days, you know, so I'm going to stop. Yes, no, one is... more. One more. African American Museum of History. I mean, if you really want to know, and you start in the basement in Washington, and D.C., yeah. Time, and you read each line. I think we were there for seven hours and we weren't done. Don't go upstairs to the sports and Motown and music. You go downstairs and you spend time there if you want to learn. Um, you know, I was visiting Jen Rosati at GW last year and, and we got a ticket and we spent the day and it really made us realize and think. So if you are in DC, you do need to plan ahead uh, and you are committed to understanding, you want to go there. So that's, that's the last one. 
Yeah, and um, you guys actually hit on a lot of my favorites. So just real quick, uh, we just watched two, uh, Just Mercy. Just Mercy. Uh, that was one that Colleen and I watched last week. And I'm gonna say, uh, I just also finished I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, a uh, book by Maya Angelou that uh, I love her, I miss her so much, and I'm excited to read more from her. So anything with her uh, is who I would recommend. So we are, uh, we did answer, answer quite a bit of questions that we got from the audience uh, throughout this discussion. Um, I do wanna ask, you know, Elizabeth, a specific question, one that came in, do you think kneeling for the national anthem is appropriate? And I know you do a lot with the WNBA, if you could just kind of talk on that a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess to answer straight up, yes, I think it's appropriate. Um, I think what Colin Kaepernick did as a Super Bowl champ is so commendable. And it's also been interesting to see the shift in how people have viewed it as um, we've seen kind of this period that started with the, the murder of George Floyd um, to people kind of like a come to Jesus moment and understanding it a little more that that these issues are systemic um, and yeah the WNBA we I think we have also prided ourselves as because we're a league of black women um, and speaking up and speaking out and and being fearless in that and so we've had players kneel we've had you know Black Lives Matter t-shirts um, and wearing them in warm-ups and talking about it in press conferences. And we've had players who um, have promoted, uh, have basically, you know, educated people on gun violence. And we had the W wears orange, um, those shirts, and just continuing to use our platform to educate, to inform, to inspire. Because again, I think at the forefront of a lot of these conversations are Black women. And, you know, we don't always get the credit for it. And so for us, um, again, it's just about speaking out and making sure that people understand what Colin Kaepernick did was not only appropriate, but it was necessary. And so I'm always grateful to be a part of the W and a part of a union that just supports its players in, in expressing that. Hey, Colleen, before you get off that, I know you mentioned, uh, you already mentioned Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Uh, I want also, you know, just from another historic context, historical context, uh, everybody look up Mexico City, 1968, uh, when you get a chance. And uh, basically during, again, the national anthem is a different way uh, that our Olympic athletes uh, tried to more or less do the same thing Colin Kaepernick did and uh, pretty much got railroaded for it. So if you've never heard of that story, Tommy Smith and uh, John Carlos, I would suggest you look it up. That's great. Hey, Miss, you were muted last time when you were trying to speak. Thank you so much, Peppy. That's great. So we got one more question before we got to wrap things up here. And this is our teammate chimed in, uh, Miss Lauren Rice. And she said, um, I love every one of you and love this important topic, but I have another question. She said, if all of you are in your prime and competing with each other, who wins a down and back sprint? And then who makes the winning free throw for free throws down the line? I already answered that one, so you know where I stand. And I already, I already responded to that because like, <laughs> once I, I caught up to you, I was right there. It would have been real close. But my junior year, senior year, it would have been real close. <laughs> Are you guys beating Elizabeth Williams right now? I'm, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, but um, I'm sure we're faster than Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, but she's oh, also like yeah. six six, so <laughs> yeah, two fair. steps. She's down. The, she's already down at the other end of the court. I am Probably not that tall. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was gonna say my money was on Elizabeth, but it was really based on youth. But again, we were supposed to take that out of the equation, so. Yeah, you I said wasn't, I wasn't right? there. So I have to take your your word on it. Shaw, what you what you what you got on there, Shaw? I'm giving it all I got. And but what I will say in looking at the four of you, I would go to war and I would take on any other other five on five at any time. So uh, <laughs> that it went, yeah. I think we probably run it a few times. <laughs> yeah, it, it would be that competitive. 
Free throw down the line. Still, come on, that's because, Shai, you're still in, like, superior shape. Like, you never – like, I think you got in better shape after you graduated from college. I may but. have. The knee, the knee finally got right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like I look at your pictures on Facebook and I just like I'm gonna go eat a hamburger and turn it off. <laughs> I was gonna say chest uh, a bench press. Shaw's got us all beat. I mean, hands Easy. down, there's no question. Yep, that's right. So, but uh, Missy can take us on a bike any day. Uh, and then Colleen can beat me. So Colleen actually leads the way with that one. Um, but in closing, where we we're, uh, we have about eight minutes left, seven minutes left. Tomorrow is a very very important day. And so uh, Juneteenth, and I would like Shaw, if you don't mind, the kind of sharing with us what that is and what the importance of it is. Yeah, actually, um, again, we're, we're trying to feed our, our players as much as possible. And as Coach Fargus sent out a great, um, an amazing article, and I'll share that in the, in the comments in a minute. So I actually took some notes. And I think with what Rose said and Pepe said, we also have to continue to do uh, research, even as Blacks. So there's some things that I, I want to make sure that do I really, really understand what Juneteenth is about? Um, first of all, it was June 19th in uh, 1865 when finally the celebration of the end of slavery came to be. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863. So we're talking two years later, not until some federal troops rode into Galveston, Texas to say, hey, you guys are free. Mm -hmm. So they were... Um, you know, they took control to make sure that the freedom was given to slaves. And when I think about Juneteenth, I think it still kind of represents freedom and liberty in how the U.S. may still kind of delay some of the rights and liberties that, that Blacks have. So I think with this coming up, it's so important, Missy, that you're saying that we, we recognize it. And I think right now, maybe 45 states have recognized it as a state holiday still. Some are, you know, some want it as a federal and you know, hopefully that will come. But I think it's just understanding that when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, it still took two years for some to be free. And I know July 4th, America's birthday, you know, Independence Day. Not until 90 years later were Blacks freed. So, you know, it, it's something that, you know, and it's true, we're talking, do we celebrate July 4th? Because we, were we really free? So understanding their debates and conversations that continue uh, and that need to be had to understand our history and to understand what our country is founded on. And one thing I wanna say that I, I don't think I mentioned is, I wanna make sure that we understand being an anti-racist does not mean we're anti-police. Like I said, I'm married to an amazing policeman, but I think that can also be a, a, a big misunderstanding is, I can be against racism, but still continue to uplift the, those amazing men and women that that serve and protect, and as as many of us said, it doesn't. It just depends on the uniform. You know, Elizabeth is in the WNBA, and and hopefully everyone is giving their best. But every once in a while, you know, some of our players make silly mistakes and and may not be doing it for the right reason. So I just uh, just hope that we can do some research, find out what Juneteenth is about, and understand that why it represents freedom and justice. There still have been some delays and some denials in where our country can and should be. Yeah, and I actually want to follow up on that really quick. I think um, one thing in talking about, you know, different resources and the fact that all of us on this panel, whether black or white, have to learn, kind of expand on the fact that this is truly systemic. You know, we're not learning the history of black America from when it began. And so, um, like, this growth and this change, it's it's slow and it's been slow just because it started at a systemic level. And I know Ro and Pepe, a lot of what you want to do from like an infrastructure perspective is to level the playing field. And so for us, like to grow and learn, it doesn't it just take the white allies holding people accountable. It takes black people understanding that this system has been broken and we're slowly building it back up. Miss me? Oh, did you, I, don't know, I thought Jen was unmuted. Jen, you're good? Okay. Yeah, Sha, I just wanted, in regard to the police, I agree. You know, we are not anti-police. In fact, I recall the protests starting underneath our building and seeing the police marching and knowing how good some of those people were. And it's really going to break me up right now because you knew how scared they were too. And living in our building, there's a lot of homeless people here. And the the compassion the police 
provide our homeless people in Tampa and seeing those same police being scared really hit me and, and it's making me upset. So I, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking this is anti-police and we need to understand both sides and there are good on both sides because there were protesters that weren't there for the right reasons, right? And there are cops doing things for the wrong reasons. There are civilians. We talk about that young man jogging, doing the wrong thing. So that's, that tells us this is beyond just the police. But we need to, what I think and I hope will happen, is these bad police, there's other police that know they're bad. And maybe now that they're being held accountable and the other police say, okay, if I do tell on them, I'm not gonna lose my job. You know, if these men are held accountable, may, maybe the good police won't be so scared because they're the breadwinner that they can step up with another guy and say, hey, I'm gonna tell someone about what just happened there. Are you with me? I mean, this is what it takes for the good men wearing uniform to stand up together is to know that when the bad guy is called out, that he's not protected by you know the hierarchy, but when the good men call out the bad men, we get rid of the bad and we keep the good and we keep building on the good. And I think there's been an issue with the tr truth within these forces that I believe now can change. These men have been held accountable and it's taken far too long, but it's these conversations so that people understand don't let your emotions get in the way. I understand it's really easy, but let's get down to how do we get here and how do we heal? And how do we get better? So I wanted to say that too about the, the police. We're thankful that we have the good ones and now I hope the good ones continue to weed out the bad ones and we become stronger for it. So we have like one minute. Uh, Miss, am I mentioning the action steps? First of all, vote not just nationally, we understand this is a year for voting, not just for the president, but locally. Understand who's running for sheriff, understand who's running for judge. You do your homework and then you tell your friends. I'll be honest with you, I haven't done that. I'm like, who looks like the Irish one? Like, I, I wasn't paying attention at all to that. I never even thought when I got in there, this was an option. I don't know what these names are. If you wanna change your community, vote on your community, but do your homework. If you really wanna make change and when you do, Educate yourself, share it with your friends. Say, hey, listen, I know not, you're not gonna look into this guy or this gal, I did, this is who we need. So first of all, people marched, people died for us to vote. So you 18 year olds or you people that are close to 18 or you adults who don't think your vote counts, it absolutely counts and people bled for it. So it is our obligation and duty to vote. Individually, what can you do? I just said, educate yourself 100% pick up a book, watch a movie, invite a friend, talk about it as a team, have a book club. But we need to educate so we can have better understanding and compassion for one another's experiences. Because we're all in America, but we're experiencing it differently. And this goes for corporate America as well. Diversity just isn't hiring people that look different, but they don't have a seat at the table. You want diversity, you hire people that look different, have different genders, and you listen to them. And say, man, she's on to something. He's on to something. And if you are successful, you reach down to your teammates of female persuasion and who are black and you pick them up. We just don't forget about the sisterhood after we graduate. We need to find each other and continue to lift one another up. Because I already said it, women need to do this. So individually, start teaching your family, start teaching your friends. Do everything you can so it spreads its tentacles in the community. Jen said it best, when you do see hate, shut it down. Not here and not in my house. I think Maya Angelou said it, I watched uh, an interview with Oprah with her recently. She goes, I don't allow that, I shut it right down. I don't allow you in here. And if more people do that, then they're not gonna speak up anymore and they will be the outlier. Don't give them that piece of you. Um, and then in the communities, if you can't vote, volunteer on voting day. Give somebody some water if they're in line. You know, Find a way to be a part of this. And lastly, if you are in a family where you're scared, to educate, to talk about it. But in your heart, you know something's wrong. Continue to educate yourself. Continue to empower yourself and be kind when you do walk by someone who's different from you. You look them in the eye as a human being because that's the team we're all on. You guys are Dukies, I'm a Husky. You know, Jen and actually uh, Missy are Huskies as well from high school. And, you know, we can get along. And we all need to be kind to one another. At the very least, you can be kind. And when you do leave your house, then you share that kindness and you become the person that you want to be. 
So I believe that we can make a difference. I think nights like tonight are just the tipping point of what we can do. I hope we continue to grow uh, this conversation. I can't thank you guys enough for allowing me into your Duke family, first of all, but being here tonight because your voices matter. Your voices have power. Uh, you're influential, successful women. And I really think that, you know, we can do something great. And I think tonight we did. So thank you very much. Miss? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, just to finish this off, you guys are my sisters. You're my comfort zone. You, you guys are my mentors. And, you know, the minute that I asked you guys if you guys be willing to join us, there was not even a hesitation, not even a second hesitation. I had immediately, yes, 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 yes. Bro, text me simply, yes. And uh, that's what needs to happen. And so for us at Beyond the Game, we don't want this conversation to end right now. We want to keep this moving. In order for that to happen, we need people in our audience who has more to share, who has more experiences that we can share across the country and really the world to email us, reach out to us, connect with us, follow us on social media at the BTGA and let us know how you can help us. And we'll continue to you know, try to put these webinars together to keep this conversation alive because one of our questions was, is this gonna die? Is this just gonna be temporary and it's gonna, we can't allow it to happen. To all of you guys, uh, the panelists, I love you. Thank you so much. Let's keep this going. And to our audience, we're so grateful that you joined us as well. Continue to, to follow us, share. You know, when you hear about our next webinar, share it with all your friends. Um, it's an easy way to start small conversations. So thank you all again. Really super grateful. Hey, Miss, I just want to end with my Angelou because oh, yeah. she's amazing. And it's a quote I just uh, came across again the other day. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And I mean, those are great words to live by. So I want to thank you all again. Uh, this has been a really wonderful night. So thank you, Missy, for putting it together.